Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. So the video that I have for you guys today is one that's actually been pretty highly requested by you guys. It's one of those cases that I do think can be solved, but I think it just needs more eyes on it and more people hearing his story. So if there was ever a case that I would ask you to share, it would be this one. I'm just hoping that by making this video, hopefully the right person will see it and maybe remember something that they didn't realize that they saw or recognize his picture. But before we get into the video, I just wanted to go ahead and say a huge shout out to my patrons, James, Angel, and Stephanie. Thank you guys so much for being a part of the Patreon family. I am so grateful for your support. You guys are what helps me keep this channel going and I appreciate each and every one of you so, so very much. Okay, with that being said, let's get into today's video. Today, we are going to be discussing the unsolved disappearance of Jefferson Riles Chapman. Jefferson Riles Chapman, who went by Riles Chapman, was 25 years old when he went missing on December 18th, 2013 from Dothan, Alabama. He was the middle child with one older brother and one younger sister. As a family, him and his brother Matthew really liked hunting. Riles was also described as being extremely athletic. When he was in high school, he made it to a state championship for golfing in Alabama. He graduated high school in 2006 and then went to their local community college. Initially, he worked with his dad to make some side money while he was in community college before he graduated at the top of his class. After graduating, he sort of just bounced around from different jobs, but he never really found exactly what he wanted to do. Also, as he was going through his education and career endeavors, he met a girl named Chelsea. The the two had dated on again, off again for a while until she found herself pregnant with their first daughter, Taylor. After this, Riles did propose to Chelsea and according to Wes, Riles' dad, the two had a very strong relationship when they wanted to, but at other times it wasn't so great. But Riles loved his daughter, Taylor. He took her everywhere he went and she absolutely loved spending time with him. However, back when Riles was in high school, he actually got caught up in some different drugs. There was this one night where Riles' parents were out of town when Riles' older brother called them to let them know that Riles and some friends had been caught with some drugs and that they needed to pick him up from the juvenile detention center. The drug that they all got caught with was weed and Riles' parents knew that this was relatively normal behavior for teenage boys. A lot of teenagers go through a phase where they try weed and alcohol and it's not too big of a deal but his parents still didn't really approve of this, so he was in trouble, and they did set up some boundaries. Then, as Riles was going through high school, he experienced some anxiety, so he went to the doctor and was prescribed some anti-anxiety meds. These prescriptions just kept getting stronger and stronger until they eventually prescribed him a medication to get him off of the original medications that he was on. But of course, because of how often he was being prescribed these medications and how strong they were getting. This sort of just snowballed out of control for him and became a real problem for him. Riles began going to a bunch of different doctors to get whatever prescriptions that he could. There wasn't really a paper trail if you just went to a different doctor and didn't tell them about a different doctor, so they would all just prescribe him different anxiety medications. These doctors were pretty much prescribing him whatever he wanted. It got so bad that he actually ended up having to go to rehab for this, but rehab didn't really seem to help him very much and he did not like rehab whatsoever. It turned into such a problem that even after he had moved out from his family's home, he actually had to move back in with his family in 2013. He lived in their pool house on Asphodel Drive in Dothan, Alabama. Wes, Riles' dad, described the situation of him living there just as sort of hanging out in his own room most of the times, but sometimes he would come into the family home at like four in the morning to grab some food and then would just go back into his own room. He was experiencing some sleeping problems and a lot of other problems in his life, and he was struggling for a bit. Now, when Riles was 23 years old, he actually ran away from his parents' house. He was actually gone for two months sleeping at different friends' houses. His parents were out there searching for him for this entire two months, but they weren't able to get a hold of him or figure out where he was until eventually he got to one friend's house who then called his parents to let them know that he was there. But once his parents found out, he did not want to come home because he was so afraid that they were going to send him back to rehab. And again, 
He hated rehab, so this was the absolute last thing that he wanted. So eventually, his parents did get him to come back home with the promise that they were not going to send him back to rehab, and they stuck to that promise. Now, in order to live at the home, his parents, Wes and Jamie, had some pretty strict rules that he was to follow. There were certain people that he was not allowed to hang out with, and of course, in general, he just was not allowed to use drugs. Again, Ryle did seem to struggle a little bit with just life in general, but as time went on, he did seem to be doing better. They hadn't gotten into as many fights about his drug use, and things were going pretty good for quite a while. A few days before his disappearance, he was actually helping his parents string Christmas lights onto their home. They saw each other every day, and things just seemed to be normal. He was finally starting to settle down, and he even held a part-time job while he lived there. Now, on December 18th, 2013, at around 7.15 p.m., Wes had gotten home from dropping his daughter off at practice and he noticed a car parked in the driveway that he thought belonged to one of Riles' old buddies that he knew did drugs and he immediately got worried. He rushed over to the pool house to talk to Riles about this because he thought that he could be with his friend doing something that he shouldn't be doing. But when he tried to enter the pool house, he couldn't get in because the door was locked. So Wes ran into the main house to try and get a key so that he could go in that way. Now, there are a couple of different entrances to get into the pool house. You can go through the bedroom or the bathroom. So Wes had grabbed the key to go ahead and get into the bathroom because he heard Riles in the shower. But even after he unlocked the door, he wasn't able to enter because Riles had actually pulled out a cabinet drawer that was right in front of the door. So as soon as he opened, it, he couldn't quite get it open because the drawer was in the way. But he could still see Riles through the crack in the door since it was open again, but it was just blocked by the cabinet drawer. And he actually saw Riles gathering some things up in the bathroom and then putting them into a plastic bag. This entire time, Wes was yelling into the bathroom, trying to get Riles' attention, but Riles just completely ignored him and did not say a word. Then, the next thing that Wes knew, he saw Riles leaving the pool house through the bedroom door. Door. He then saw him running away from the home wearing only his boxer shorts, yelling that somebody was chasing him. I do want to clarify that Wes did see him running out of the pool house, but he didn't actually see him running once he was outside. So he ended up running to the far side of the house and ended up in front of the house where he saw his mom and he actually stopped and waved at her. And he actually didn't bring anything with him. He left his keys and his wallet behind, which had all of his money in it. Also, apparently that morning, he had just quit his job and he cashed his last check, but he didn't take any of that money with him either. Then there was also a question of whether he had a small plastic bag with him, and again, Wes did see him gathering up a bunch of different items, but it's not really known if he took this bag with him or what exactly was in the bag if he did take them with him. A few minutes after Wes saw Riles running from the home at around 7.30 p.m., a family friend actually spoke spotted him at the entrance of the Bocage subdivision on US 84 in West Dothan. The friend didn't really think too much of this initially because his boxer shorts did look kind of similar to running shorts, so initially she thought that maybe he was just a runner. But I will note that Riles actually was not wearing any shoes when he ran off, so it's a little bit weird that this family friend saw him thought he was running even though he wasn't wearing any shoes, but that's besides the point. Either way, after this, he was never seen again. The part of this that I thought was just a little bit sad was that after Wes looked more into who the car belonged to, it actually did not belong to that friend that he thought it belonged to. Instead, it belonged to Riles's brother's girlfriend. Now, after the disappearance, his parents were concerned, but he had run off before and he came back within a few months. So, while they did go out and search for him just like they did when he ran away when he was 23, they did think that he was just going to come back home eventually. They did call a few of his friends and told them to keep a lookout for him, but other than that, they just assumed that he was going to come back. At this point, they were just more upset and angry that he was running off right before Christmas. He left his daughter, and he had also just recently had a baby boy who wasn't even a year old at that point. 
It wasn't until Christmas when he still wasn't home that they realized that maybe he really was not coming home. And they realized that maybe this wasn't just him running off. Maybe this was something more. Obviously, in retrospect, they wished that they had done something sooner and they kicked themselves for not doing anything sooner. But the same thing happened before. So they thought that it was the same thing as before and they didn't think that it was very serious this time. So I don't want to see anybody in the comments talking about how it's their fault because they didn't do anything right away. It's literally based on his past behaviors and you have to take that into consideration when you listen to these cases. So eventually they did report him missing and police started their searches. They put up flyers and billboards. They had hell helicopters and a horseback crew to search the wooded area. They searched everywhere in the area surrounding the home, but they didn't find anything. So now let's go back to the day that he went missing and talk about some of the things that can give us a couple of more clues as to why he may have run off. So initially after he ran off, Riles' parents went into his room to see if there was anything weird in there that could tell them what was going on. So first, they found his phone and brought it inside. They hadn't done anything with his phone, but after around 30 minutes of it just sitting there, Riles did receive a call and Wes actually did know the person who was calling. So this person named Richard was an old employee of Wes's and he knew that this man also had trouble with drugs in the past, but he still didn't use as far as Wes knew because when he worked for him, he was clean. So when he saw who the call was from, Wes immediately picked up the phone. He asked Richard how he knew Riles and he said that Riles owed him $25 and he was supposed to be dropping by later that day to pick it up. Of course, he asked him if he knew anything about Riles running off, but he said that he didn't know anything about it. Now, Richard did say that he was supposed to be meeting him at the end of the street because he knew that he wasn't allowed in the house. But other than that, Richard didn't say anything else. So the timing of all of this is just pretty weird. He was questioned by police a few times after this, but we don't really know what came of that. And after this, Wes had never talked to Richard again. Now, as far as Wes knows, nobody has tried to contact Riles again. He held onto Riles' phone, so he noticed that he didn't get any more texts or phone calls, but he was never able to look at the actual records. He did say that police did have his cell phone records, but they haven't said anything about them, so they're either just not significant or they're keeping it close to the vest for whatever reason. So the next thing they found in his room was a bottle of pills. Wes said that he didn't know exactly how many pills were in there, but it was something that he was not supposed to be taking. They also initially found a bag that was full of clothes. It looked as if he had packed up these clothes with the intention to leave for a while, but obviously he didn't end up taking it with him. The other weird thing that happened was the morning after Riles had run off, Wes went outside to see that the tire on his front passenger side of his car was actually cut. So this made him think that maybe one of Riles' acquaintances or friends did this, or that Riles had come back that night to grab his clothes because, as we know, he literally left in his boxers. It was December, and even though this is Alabama in the South, it does get pretty cold at night. They did say that after this night, the only thing that they couldn't find in his room anymore was this bag of clothes, so it's thought that he went back to the pool house to go ahead and grab his clothes. So they do have a gate around their yard, and I think that it has a code to get in so strangers can't get in, but obviously Riles would have known the code so he was able to get in, and then they also kept the pool house house unlocked in case Riles wanted to come back. So this is all really pointing towards Riles coming back getting his clothes, and then leaving again. The other thing that I want to know is, like I mentioned earlier, the same morning of the day that he ran off, Riles quit his job. Now, it just so happened that the week before he quit, he had actually gotten sick at work because I think he worked as a roofer, so it was so hot that he had ended up getting sick. So, the question is, is did he quit his job because he got sick and he was just kind of sick of his job, 
or had he planned to run off the same day? Now, there have been a few people who have reached out to the family through their Find Missing Riles Facebook page, basically saying that they know what happened to Riles. One guy in particular was somebody who knew Riles, but he was in and out of jail when he was questioned, so it seems like maybe he had an ulterior motive to help himself. This person that messaged them seemed to have insinuated that maybe he was involved in Riles' disappearance, and he knows what happened because of that. But this has never really been confirmed, and Wes doesn't really know what to make of this. Next, there have been some possible sightings of Riles after the disappearance. Now, the neighborhood that they live in is decently well populated, and we know that there was this sighting of him by a friend after he had ran to the edge of the neighborhood. And I will note that he was kind of tired and out of breath by the time he reached the edge of the neighborhood after running that far. The area is surrounded pretty pretty heavily by woods, so it's thought that maybe he ran off into the woods. The reason people think this possibly is because he was tired after running to the edge of the neighborhood, so he couldn't have gotten very far, so it's possible that he just ran into the woods to hide out for a little bit. So, that could be possible that he went into the woods to hide. Now, I will say that after he was reported missing, the woods were searched with cadaver dogs, helicopters, volunteers, and all of that, and they didn't find anything that had to do with Riles. So, it's always possible that he did go into the woods for a bit after he was last seen, but we know that his body or any of his personal belongings have not been found in the woods. So, knowing all of this, it's pretty much assumed that sometime after he was seen at the edge of the neighborhood, he may have hidden out in the woods for quite some time, but after this, at some point, someone must have picked him up in a car. But, after this, we really have no idea what could have happened. We also know that there was a ton of sightings of him after that day. However, as his dad explained, Riles is a pretty average looking dude. So, people would call in with all sorts of sightings, saying that they saw him walking down the road or that they saw him at a motel or a soup kitchen. So, it's always possible that these sightings were 100% true and it definitely could have been Riles, but these were never actually confirmed, so it's hard to know how accurate and true these sightings really were. But there was one sighting in particular that seemed very credible. So, in March of 2014, around three months after Riles disappeared, there was a family friend who was down in Panama City, Florida, who was down there with her son, visiting the son's girlfriend. So, I guess Riles saw the son's girlfriend there and spoke to her because Riles knew her. They actually graduated high school together and had been friends in the past. And apparently, at this time, Riles looked very skinny, and he was with two other people when he was speaking to this friend. One was a man who had a bunch of tattoos, and the other was a woman who had a bunch of tattoos. Riles and this friend had spoken a bit. I don't know if the other two got involved in the conversation or if they were just standing there, but before Riles had ended the conversation, he told this friend, don't tell my mom and dad that you saw me here. Then, him and the two others walked away. Now, at the time, this friend friend didn't even know that Riles was missing. She was now living in Florida, not Alabama, so she just didn't know what was going on up in Alabama. So it actually wasn't until a few weeks after she had spoken to Riles that she had told her dad about this, you know, just casually and talking. And her dad actually did happen to be friends with Wes. So her dad went ahead and told Wes about her talking to Riles. The dad did know that Riles was missing, so of course he went ahead and told Wes about this friend who had seen Riles in Panama City. So just because of how all of this happened, it seemed to be pretty believable. But we don't know what this conversation was even about, and we don't know the identities of the two other people that he was seen with. But it can show that even after a few months of being missing, there's a huge possibility that he made it all the way down to Panama Beach and that he was okay, or at least that he was alive. However, unfortunately after this, there haven't been any other signs of him. And still, eight years later, 
there isn't much more information. The family is relying heavily on the public to help find Riles to hopefully recognize him if he is out there. Now, in terms of theories, we can obviously gather that there are really two main theories. We obviously know that initially he had run off on his own, and I do personally believe the sighting of him in Florida. This person who saw him was a friend of his, and she didn't even know that he was missing, so I don't think that she would have mixed him up with anybody else, and I don't think that she would just be making up this story for whatever reason. So to me, this makes it seem like this definitely could be a real sighting. So with that being said, the first theory is that of course he left on his own and is still out there living his life and he's just chosen not to come home. I do think that this definitely could be possible. Now, the reason that he left is still unclear and how long he actually initially planned to leave is also unclear. We know that he left in sort of a bit of a panic, so that's probably the reason why he left in his boxers and nothing else. Was he using at the time and became very paranoid? Did he have an underlying mental illness that caused this? We don't really know, but it seems clear that for whatever reason, he was afraid of his dad catching him doing something that he wasn't supposed to be doing, and that is why he left. Clearly, his dad was a little bit sus that he was hanging out with someone that he wasn't supposed to, so I imagine that he went into this pool house talking in the dad tone, you know, how dads talk when they catch you doing something that you're not supposed to be doing. I'm sure he wasn't being overly mean or aggressive or anything, but Riles may have already been on edge and he knows that he's probably breaking the family rules, so this could have been what caused him to panic and want to just leave. I also wonder, had he been planning to leave for quite a while already and Wes knocking just sort of accelerated that, his quitting his job that same morning may point to him planning to leave. But the frustrating thing is that that could also just be a coincidence since, like we said earlier, he had gotten sick on the job just a few days earlier, so that could be why he quit. Next, we know that just two years before this, he had run off and he didn't come back until his parents physically found him, and even after they found him, it took a lot of convincing to get him to come back home. So I don't think that it's completely unreasonable to say that he may have planned on leaving permanently this time. It's possible that he left and just hasn't been found because he went a lot further this time. I know that it's been almost eight years, but just think about it. The longer that he's gone, the less likely he is to want to come home. For one, I think that he may have just gotten used to living his life on his own, on the streets, or with friends, or wherever he ended up going. Then, I feel like he was so scared to come home the first time that he could have been convinced that he's gonna get in trouble for sure this time and that they're for sure gonna send him back to rehab. Or maybe he even thinks that his family doesn't want him to come home, which is not true at all. They want him to come home so badly. We know that he was struggling his own demons and having two children on top of that can just make your life feel so stressful that he felt like he needed to leave. Then, now that I mention his kids, that can be another reason for him not wanting to come back home. Maybe he just feels really guilty and just doesn't want to come back to kids that he's left for so long. Again, kids can be a huge motivating factor for coming back, and I'm sure if he is out there, he misses them so much, and he probably wishes that he could go back to them, but again, I think with his situation, he could just feel so guilty and so unwanted that he feels like he can't come back to them. So, to me, considering all of this, I think it's possible that he is out there living his life and doing what he wants. I also think that it's reasonable to assume that he hasn't been seen again by anyone in the public because, to put it bluntly, people just aren't thinking about his case anymore. It's an older case and people have moved on, so that is exactly why I'm bringing this case back to light so that people can see him again and if they do recognize him, to come forward with that information. However, with this theory, something that jumps out to me is the fact that he didn't even bring any money with him. If he had planned to leave for so long, 
Why would he leave all of his money at home? Why would he go and cash his check just to never use the money? This honestly doesn't even make any sense. And even if someone is in a state of mind where they're on drugs or even in some sort of psychosis, he would have taken his money. He had the peace of mind to pack clothes with him and go back and get them after leaving. So why didn't he bring any money? I will say that it's possible that he may have forgotten his wallet because he was leaving in a hurry and his dad was right there. I have had that happen, even me, in a state of mind where I'm not panicking, I'm not, you know, frantically trying to leave, where I have forgotten my wallet simply because I'm just not thinking about it and I forgot where I put it or just didn't think to grab it. So I could definitely see that happening. And his dad actually was holding on to his phone and his wallet after he left, so maybe he just couldn't go back in and get his wallet because he didn't want to go back into the main house and have his parents catch him. So maybe because of all of this, that's why he ended up going with no money because again, he couldn't go face his dad to ask for his wallet back, you know, that just wouldn't happen. But then still it makes me wonder, how are you going to live if you have absolutely no money. I don't know if he had money that his parents just didn't know or if he borrowed money from a friend and the parents just haven't found that out. I really don't know how he would have had any money to make it by and to get to Florida. I honestly have no idea. So because of all of this, I don't know what to think. I can definitely see why he would have left with no money and how it would have happened that he didn't get his money back, but I don't know how he would live after that with no money. So then within this theory, we have to consider that maybe he is alive, but maybe he's involved in things that make it impossible for him to come home. Maybe he fell into the wrong crowd in Florida and found himself working in a situation and for someone scary, and now he's in a spot where he just can't leave and he's afraid that if he did try to leave that he'd be harmed. So maybe he's alive but he's in hiding because of somebody that he's involved with. Maybe it's the people who he was seen with at the beach. Maybe they have something to do with it. We can't really say for sure and I'm not really going to speculate beyond that but it is possible that he's out there and this is why he just hasn't come home yet. I also kind of want to note that within this theory is that maybe he ran off initially because of people he was involved with in Alabama and that's why he ended up in Panama City because he wanted to get away from those individuals and maybe they caught up with him or maybe he's just so afraid of them that he's staying in Panama City or wherever else he ended up. I do want to note that as well. It doesn't always have to have something to do with the people in Florida. That could be why he ran off initially in the first place. So the next theory is that he was harmed at some point after he left. This could be possible for a number of reasons reasons. First, we know that he was involved in drugs and that can be a very dangerous path. Like I said in the previous theory, it is possible that he got caught up in the wrong crowd. Maybe like I just said, he got caught up with the wrong crowd in Alabama and that's why he ran off, but then they caught up to him and they harmed him at some point after that. Or like I said before that, in relation to these two other people that he was seen with, maybe rather than just making him work and stay in hiding, maybe they harmed him for owing them money or something else along those lines. We know that he didn't really take his money with him, so how would he have been able to pay for anything? Maybe he got into a pretty large debt with someone bad and that's what caused all of this. Then, of course, we have to consider who would have harmed him. Again, was it the people that he was seen with? Was it a random stranger? Was it someone else who was involved in the drug scene? We really have no idea. Now, I will note that some people have speculated that this Richard guy had something to do with it. When it comes to Richard calling him the very day that he went missing, I do think that it's a strange coincidence, but I don't think personally, based on what I've heard, I don't think he had anything to do with it. Now, I do think that he could have known that Riles was planning to leave, so he wanted to catch him before he ran off so that he could get his money. Or maybe they had already planned this meetup, which seems like they had based on this phone call, and then Riles skipped before he had the chance to do so because he just didn't have the money to give him. So I think both of those things can be true. The fact that he ran off because he didn't want to pay him, or maybe, again, it just sort of happened that way where they had planned to meet up and then 
Wes spooked him and that's why he ran off not even thinking about the fact that he was meeting up with Richard later. I don't think $25 is enough to kill somebody over. I don't think Richard would go after Riles because of $25. I think if he did, that would be pretty ridiculous ridiculous in my opinion. I know things have been done for less, but to me that just doesn't seem like enough money to kill someone. Could have been more than $25. Maybe he was just saying $25 on the phone to Wes so that he didn't spook him and make him think that Riles was in a lot more trouble than he was. I really don't know. This is just me speculating at this point, but at the end of the day, knowing what we know, I don't think Richard is personally responsible for harming him. Then again, we know that there was this other random guy who messaged Riles' parents saying that he knew exactly what happened. But again, we don't know if this is credible. We don't know exactly, you know, why this person even reached out to them in the first place. So we really don't know if this is true or if it's just him messing with them or trying to get something out of them. I really don't know. But I don't put a lot into this either. At the end of the day, Riles could have been associating with any number of people who are just completely unknown to us and to police, so it makes it really difficult to try and pinpoint who may be responsible. Honestly, to me, I don't know what to think. With this case, I think it's just as likely that he's still out there as it is that he was harmed. I like to hope that he's still out there and I hope that by making this video, we can get his face out there. Maybe he's still in Florida or maybe he's in a nearby state. So I just ask from me to you that you go ahead and keep an eye out because I think if there's any case that could be solved by making a video and spreading awareness, it's this one. If he's still out there, he needs to know that his family is still desperately searching for him and all they want is for him to come home or at least know that he's okay. They have said that he has every right not to come home, but they just want to know what happened and if he's okay. Jefferson Riles Chapman was 25 years old when he was last seen on December 18th, 2013 from Dothan, Alabama. Riles is six feet one inch tall, weighs 180 pounds. He has brown hair and blue eyes. If you have absolutely any information on Riles' whereabouts, please contact Corporal Owens at the Dothan Police Department at 334 828 1072 or call We Help the Missing Tip Line 866 660 4025. If you want to stay up to date with Riles' case, please make sure to check out the family's Facebook where they are still talking about Riles and still spreading information about his disappearance. Eight years is far too long for someone to be gone, so again, if you know anything, please don't hesitate to come forward with what you know. So that is all I have for today's video, and now I want to know what you guys think. Do you think he's still out there? And if he is, do you think that he wants to be gone, or do you think that he doesn't have a choice? Or do you think that he was harmed, or do you have any other ideas of what may have happened? please let me know down in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. And don't forget to turn on the notification bell to be notified of any future video of mine. Don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. Pretty much every single case that I cover here on my channel comes directly from that email. So again, make sure to go ahead and send over your case suggestions. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy and I hope to see you next time. Bye.